Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delivering a speech by Malcolm S. Message to the grassroots, delivered on the 10th of November, 1963, in Detroit, Michigan. And during the few moments that we have left, we want to have just an off-the-cuff chat between you and me, us. We want to talk right down to it in a language that everybody here can easily understand. We all agree tonight, all the speakers have agreed, that America has a very serious problem. Not only does America have a very serious problem, but our, our people have a very serious problem. America's problem is us. We're her problem. The only reason she has a problem is she doesn't want us here. And every time you look at yourself, be you black, brown, red, or yellow, a so-called Negro, you represent a person who, doesn't, who poses such a serious problem for America because you're not wanted. Once you face this as a fact, you can start plotting a course that will make you appear intelligent instead of unintelligent. What you and I need to do is to learn to forget our differences. When we come together, we don't come together as Baptists or Methodists. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist and you don't catch hell because you're a Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist or Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Democrat or a Republican. You don't catch hell because you're a Mason or an Elk. You don't catch hell because you're an American. Because if you were an American, you wouldn't catch no hell. You catch hell because you're a black man. You catch hell, all of us catch hell for the same reason. So we're all black people, so-called Negroes, second-class citizens, ex-slaves. You're nothing but an ex-slave. You don't like to be told that, but what else are you? An ex-slave. You didn't come here on the Mayflower. You came here on a slave ship, in chains, like a horse, or a cow, or a chicken. And you were brought here by the people who, was, who came here on the Mayflower. You were brought here by the founding fathers as so-called pilgrims. They were the ones who brought you here. We have a common enemy. We have this in common. We have a common oppressor, a common exploiter, and a common discriminator. But once we all realize that we have this in common, that we unite on that basis. We unite on the basis that our enemy is the white man. He's an enemy to all of us. I know some of you all think that some of them aren't enemies. Time will tell. And when you and I here in Detroit and in Michigan and in America, who have been awakened today, look around us, we too realize here in America, we all have a common enemy. Whether he's in Georgia or Michigan, whether he's in California or New York, he's the same man. Blue eyes, blonde hair, and pale skin, same man. So what we have to do is what they did. They agreed to stop calling among themselves. Any little spot they had, they set it among themselves. We go into a huddle. Don't let the enemy know that you got a disagreement. Instead of us airing our differences, we have to realize we are all the same family. And when you have a family squabble, you don't go out on the sidewalk. If you do, everybody calls you uncouth, unrefined, uncivilized, savage. If you don't make it at home, you settle it at home. Get behind the closet, argue behind the closed doors. And then when you come out on the street, you pose a common front, a united front. And this is what we need to do in the communities, in the cities, and in the states. We need to stop any differences in front of the white man. Put the white man out of our meetings, number one, and then sit down and talk shop with each other. That's all you got to do. I would like to make a few comments concerning the difference between the Black Revolution and the Negro Revolution. There's a difference. Are they both the same? And if they're not, what is the difference? What is the difference between a Black Revolution and a Negro Revolution? First, what is a revolution? Sometimes I am inclined to believe that our people are using the word revolution loosely without taking careful consideration of what this word actually means and what its, what its historic characteristics are. When you study the historic nature of revolutions, the motive of a revolution, the objective of a revolution, and the results of a revolution, and the methods used in a revolution, you may change words, you may devise another program, 
you may change your goal and you may change your mind. Look at the American Revolution in 1776. The revolution was for what? Land. What they wanted land? Independence. How was it carried out? Bloodshed. Number one, it was based on land. The basis of independence, and the only way they could have, they could have gotten it was bloodshed. There was no love loss, there was no compromise, there was no negotiation. I'm telling you, you don't know what a revolution is. Because when you find out what a revolution is, you will get out of the way, you will get back in the alley. The Russian Revolution, what was it based on? Land, the landless against the landlord. How did they bring it out? Bloodshed. You haven't got a revolution that doesn't involve bloodshed. And you are afraid to bleed. I said you are afraid to bleed. Thank you.